This is the Mile High Five podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Phi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Phi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Phi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. Hello, world. Welcome to the Mile High Five podcast. I am Carl Jensen with my co-host. I'm Doug Cunnington. We have a very special guest today. I think they're all very special. I say that same thing every time. <laughs> but but this one is pretty special. Tell us who you are and what you do. My name is David Boyer. I am retired officially as of about a year and a half ago. I'm retired Navy, but, but I'm probably in the financial independence space known more for being Stephen Boyer's brother, who is the founder of Camp Phi. And today we're going to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and this is decompressing after quitting work, especially for people with intense, fast-paced, and stressful jobs. You're a pretty high-performing individual, David. You were an officer in the military. You you went to Vanderbilt, which I didn't know much about until I was in – uh, Nashville recently, and apparently they call it like the Harvard of the South or something like that. I know Vanderbilt wanted to create a fancy school uh, it, in his neck of the woods. I think that's the story behind it. I'm probably butchering. David, you can correct me and all that. So to back up a second, David, you had a pretty stressful job and, and all that. And, and I can kind of relate to this. I think I'm five years out and I still have not decompressed. So I look forward to hearing what you have to say on the topic. Awesome. Sure. So uh, my job was, it was stressful. So I like to think of my career probably in like two separate sections, the first 12 years or so, and then the last eight years or so. The first 12 years were characterized as seagoing, operational, high operational tempo, and stressful jobs. And the stress didn't go away uh, later, but the quality of life jobs definitely uh, showed up versus the first 12 years. So my first 12 years, I was on three different ships. I spent a year in Iraq, in Baghdad. And so, and on those three ships, I did three different deployments. So that was, that represented the first roughly half of my career. After that, the second half of my career, again, better quality of life jobs, where I was the commanding officer of a Navy operational support center. I think they're called reserve centers now. And that's basically the hub where reservists will go and make sure that they get their training requirements met, their medical requirements met, and whatever pay issues they may have. There was, I was in charge of an active duty staff that supported that. And that was in Erie, Pennsylvania. So if you want to talk about weather stress, we could talk about some of the <laughs> finest weather in the country. Uh, which is why now I'm in San Diego and uh, somewhere half between Erie and San Diego, both geographically and weather-wise, is are you uh, right now, which is like 30 degrees in Colorado right now. And then my last job, my last three years of my career, I was teaching three theater strategic planning to senior reserve officers at the Joint Forces Staff College in Norfolk, Virginia. And that was where I was able, I have a degree in education. So throughout my career, I've been able to teach quite a bit and Uh, I hope, and I always wanted that might be an option after my career too, but I just haven't stepped back into uh, the working world quite yet. What is the weather like in Erie for people that don't know? Okay. So let me start off by saying the people of Erie are amazing. I've never felt more at home (laughs) uh, and really they just, they appreciate good weather when they get it. They appreciate the military when we were there. Uh, I've been in Pensacola uh, Mayport, Florida, Norfolk, Virginia, San Diego, other locations, Great Lakes, Illinois, and nobody uh, in any of those fleet concentration areas uh, accepted uh, the military as the people of Erie did. So for that, I'll be forever grateful. And they also uh, welcomed our family uh, there too. The weather is a different story. So about two months out of the year, you might get good weather. When I say good, I mean great weather. I think that's probably like mid-June to mid-August, and then it turns very quickly on the other side of that. I think we've gotten snow in October and snow in May. Uh, So it goes pretty quick, but they do appreciate it. But it's brutal because you've got Lake Erie right there, and the wind brings so much snow uh, in. And Erie's just north, 
northwest of Pittsburgh. So if you were to look at map and how rectangular Pennsylvania is, it's that top left part. And it was just, it was just brutal. Uh, I live very close to where I worked. So I, I would walk to work most times. You definitely bundle up and after you shovel snow. And here's an embarrassing story. So I bought a truck in 2011 here in San Diego when I was stationed here and took that front wheel drive, beautiful Dodge Ram black truck to Erie, Pennsylvania. And it must've been like maybe a half inch of snow, maybe an inch of snow. And I could not get it, get it over the lip of my driveway. And so neighbors <laughs> are just pointing and laughing. Yeah. Uh, needless to say, I traded that pretty quick for a car I didn't really care about. And I uh, could take the beating and the, right. the salt on the roads up there. Oh man. And it was a rear wheel drive, right? Uh, the truck was rear right? Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. And it's not just, um, the snow, it's also really gray there. Right. So at least, mm -hmm. um, there's some places where you get some snow, it's cold, it's very, very cold, but the sun shines, but in Erie, it's like kind of gray for a lot of months of the year. Right. It is because it's so close to water it brings that moisture in the air. Yeah. That's rough. Crazy. And then in San Diego, what's it like? Awesome all the time. Right. You would, th yes, from your perspective, yes. Here, San Diegans, man, I, I, I kind of make fun of them because as soon as it's chilly, if it's if it's not within that 10 degree range of 68 to 78, it's either too hot or way too cold. And they let you know it too. And I'm just like, you. I come from Georgia, so I know heat and I've lived in Erie, so I know cold. But this is pretty ideal weather here. Right now, it's a little, it is a little chilly for San Diego standards here right now. Well, it is zero degrees here, David, or it was when I woke up this morning. So, is that wind chill or actual? No, that's actually I hate wind chill. Wind chill is a stupid thing because it's it's uh, <laughs> it, it drives me nuts. It's meant to make it sound more dramatic than it is because that is how cold it feels on bare skin. Like, do you ever, if it's zero degrees outside, do you ever go outside naked? I don't know about you, Doug, but I do not. So, therefore, wind chill is irrelevant. It's stupid. It's to make it sound more dramatic than it is. But no, that was the actual temperature. I have no idea what the wind chill is. Well, now I'm getting a video image for how you're going to share with your audience how this podcast <laughs> ends. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the thing is, uh, I wind chill, I don't know if I, it's like heat index. It does help, though, because I was going to say the other day it was like 50 some odd degrees, but it was like a 30 mile an hour wind. And I walked outside and I was like, it's really fucking cold. So I had to like rebundle up because I was thinking, ah, oh, it's sunny and it's 50 degrees. It should be okay. But the wind was so intense. And I didn't know. I didn't know until I walked out. I, I think the weather people are messing with your mind. Up. Yeah. It's fine. Well, I don't trust them anymore. It's like everything's the storm of the you know year, century, or whatever. It's so dramatic now. Yeah, yeah. It's it's all clickbait. Yeah. All right. Can uh, I talk about Carl for a minute? Yes. So for everybody who's listening, if you don't personally know Carl, uh, he's probably one of the most genuine, nicest, and funny people you'll ever meet. But he's also always got a to-do list a mile long and can't seem to get out of it. And... Uh, he expresses desire to get out of it, but yet he continues to put things on his to-do list. So, Carl, what are you doing to get rid of that to-do list? Um, well, David, uh, funny you mentioned that because on my to-do list, I just yesterday, I put Visit David on there. So I'm planning a trip to come out and see you. But maybe with your snarky comment, maybe I'll just delete that off there. I won't come see you, David. I won't grace you <laughs> with my presence. Um, yeah, so that is, uh, it, all joking aside, uh, I am getting rid of that. We're going to finish this other house, which I came from working on this morning. And uh, yeah, I work more now than I did when I had a job. I've been doing like 12-hour days this week, uh, but it's almost over and uh, we're not going to do that anymore. It's going to be done. I'm going to focus on learning Spanish, uh, some of my other projects, and visiting you in beautiful San Diego, hopefully when the weather is shitty here in Colorado. Well, between the two of you, uh, Carl, I believe you are the better guest. <laughs> Doug also has come to visit me as well. No, both of you have been great. Now, Carl, I say that because you just said that to me just now, but you also said that to me like a year ago and a year and a half ago, <laughs> and yet you still added on another house and renovation. And so what are you really going to change this time? I know it's over. I, I am really, really done after this. I'm not going to add anything else. We are buying no more houses or any of that shit. Yeah. I will say for, 
for somebody who has you know type A like you and me, and I don't know about Doug's personality as far as the type, I would say he's probably not quite type A. What do you think, Doug? Yeah, probably not quite type A. Probably certain areas uh, yeah. I, I could drive stuff, but a lot of stuff I'm just I'm much lazier than than uh, Carl. Yeah, in general, a lot of people think you would have an issue going from a type A to slow down. Uh, so even after a high operational tempo career of any kind, whether it's computer programming or military, I think if you just take that same type A personality and focus it to shape uh, the life that you see for yourself as desirable, just take that same energy and that same passion and you know have a to-do list, but maybe on that to-do list say, do nothing and then actually stick to it. Uh, so I would recommend you do that and have days where you really just don't do anything and see where that gets you. And you don't really know where that limit is. So for me, I knew I didn't want my first 20 years of my, my next 20 years to look like my last 20 years. I knew I didn't want to be stressed out. I know I didn't want to have, um, be responsible for things that I can't control, uh, to a great extent. And so when I retired, I just really got down, listed my values, and then really tried to use my resources, which are time, money, and energy, uh, to really fulfill those values. And if I found myself doing other things that were not in alignment with those values, then either my values were incorrect or I needed to realign my resources. So that's kind of a type A way of looking at how to get in alignment with your true self and really what matters to you uh, and, and in your core. And I think if we can do that, then we're able to put our head on our pet uh, head on our pillow at night uh, a little bit uh, more soundly and, and confidently with who we are. So Carl, I look forward to seeing you on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think, um, well, we didn't, we didn't know we were going to, um, talk about you this much this early, but I mean, you you worked really hard in in your career, right, uh, Carl? And I'm also curious: were you like a high performer at your job? So for me, and I think I've said this in some shows, where like I was average, and I I wasn't like you know really high performer that reflected in my promotions and my <laughs> raises over time. And I, you know, I, I worked it out. Everything was fine. But yeah, were you, were you like um, one of the best at what you were doing? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not a gifted computer programmer. Like there's some rock star people in there. If you've got someone who's really good, they can do the work of 10 people. Uh, those kind of people are pretty rare. I wasn't that. I wasn't. Um, and a lot of people you work with are kids who were programming, like their parents bought them a Commodore 64 or some other computer. I wasn't that. I never really used a computer before college, maybe a little bit in high school, but we never had one at home. So I wasn't gifted, but you can push through a lot of things in life with brute force. I remember we had one guy who was assigned to something. He had to do the login for our system. He's like, oh, we'll just create a local login for each computer. I'm like, well, that's a disaster. You don't want that. You want this to be integrated with Active Directory. He's like, well, I can't figure that out. I'm like, okay, I'm going to take this from you and, and figure this out. I also did the virtualization, so I learned all that. Um, but yeah, you could push through a lot of stuff if you're determined and willing to put the time in. So I think I was a high performer, but it was because I put many, many hours in and just outworked everyone else. Cool. And I think, I mean, I, I definitely fall in that area. I can, I could figure some stuff out. I was good at debugging, which is a lot of coding, right? Um, and just like, like you said, brute force your way through. So yeah, pretty interesting. Now we have to come back to David. Um, and I had no experience in the military, although I had a lot of friends in the military back in Georgia. So what was it like, um, David? You mentioned it was kind of two segments, first 12 years, then eight. So for people like Carl and I, who really don't know what it's like, you, you were deployed, you saw a lot of action. So can you tell us just a little bit of what it was like from maybe a stress level, how much uh, you know work it was, what you thought it was going to be and how it was different. And I'll just kind of leave it open on however you want to describe it. Sure. So you mentioned stressful. So thinking back of my most stressful job, it wasn't, you might think based on what I said earlier, it was my year in Iraq. And of course, uh, there's some things that happened there that were stressful and uh, 
you know, not, it wasn't a nice vacation spot to be at or anything like that, but the most stress I've ever felt, I was the department head for the engineering plant on board a ship out here in San Diego uh, for three years. And that job, so you're in charge of everything at all engineering uh, on the ship, uh, water, air, um, the engine, everything, um, steering. So, so there's a lot of maintenance and on all, on many of these ships, uh, they require a lot of maintenance and repair. And then all, while you're doing all of those things, you have periodic assessments, Gr- groups of people come on board, they assess your training programs, uh, the, your damage control responses, uh, and your programs in general. So uh, there was one time where I don't think I, I think I didn't sleep for over 48 hours and, and then the assessment happened and it didn't go well, uh, or at least as well as, as I anticipated. Uh, and then there was some other things that happened there too. So that was probably the most physical stress I've gone through and you, I've definitely found my limits, uh, both emotionally, physically, uh, and mentally. And so I learned a lot during that tour. And it definitely shaped how I went moved forward. Uh, being type A, maybe you don't delegate well uh, because you think you can do it better. Um, but then after that experience uh, and me being pushed so so much personally, uh, I decided to delegate a lot more. And then honestly, select certain things that I didn't care about uh, or that I shouldn't care about as much as others. And that was a, a good transition time for a, and, and a learning experience for me. And that shaped how my leadership went forward. And there were probably some, you know, good, fun parts in the military. Any any highlights where you're like, oh, yeah, I kind of miss this stuff now that, you know, you're not in there? I'll say in general, I miss very little. Uh, I know I'm not, I don't believe I'm the norm in that. I do know that many people who leave the military miss the camaraderie uh, and uh, maybe to some extent the job itself of the things I think I miss right now is probably problem solving, but then that can be problems need to be solved all the time, whether you're in or outside the military. So I can just find other things to other problems to solve. Uh, but uh, if one of the, one of the events that I really do miss is being out on a ship on the bridge in the middle of the ocean at night or in the daytime for that matter, uh, and just looking out and driving a ship, it's very peaceful and it's very fun. Unfortunately, that's only one, like one tenth of the job that people have out there. There's usually about other, you know, a, a good other, uh, a lot more work out there than just driving a ship for anyone. Huh. You have a cruise port by you. You can go buy a ticket for a carnival cruise and jump on a <laughs> boat. I guess they probably won't let you steer, but maybe, I don't know, your military, you can talk and go see the captain and I, I don't know. I'm picturing that big wood yeah. wheel, which I'm sure no ships actually have. They probably don't have a wheel at all. It's probably all they computers, do. but they do. They do have they that do. thing or really? They do. It's called a helm. Yeah, they do have one. And <clears throat> yes, they have one. Uh, I don't know how many are, are now completely operational, but I know the ships that I've been on, and this is over a decade ago or right out a dec- decade ago as I was on my last ship. And many of those ships are becoming uh, older and decommissioned or their systems are being upgraded and most do navigate by GPS uh, anyway, uh, but uh, the steering, yes, there's a big wheel and you've, you know, all into the head one third, indicate whatever turns for however many knots and come right, steer course, 270. Yeah, all that stuff is still out there. And uh, it, that, that's the fun part of the job. There's just a lot of not fun parts as well. But... So yeah, in San Diego, my son and I were, we walked down to the Marina the other day and Disney has a cruise line out here. And so of course the kid sees Mickey Mouse on the side of a ship and he's like, when are we going to go on this cruise? I'm like, you know, I could drive that ship, right? He's like, what? So my son is almost nine. So he doesn't know me. Uh, he was born after my last ship tour. So it's kind of interesting. Now he looks here in San Diego and sees many people in the, in the Navy. And now he doesn't see me in uniform anymore. And so I think it's piquing his interest, but he still seems surprised when he, he found out I had a, a real job and did kind of some cool things in my career. 
Where did college fit into all this? At what point? Was that in the middle of your service or when did you go to Vanderbilt? Uh, great question. So Stephen, my brother and I, we both enlisted into the Navy right after graduation in 1996. We both went to Great Lakes, Illinois boot camp together. It was very it, it, cold, I think, from it, these two Georgia boys shoveling snow in November. Was that graduation from college or high school? That was high school. Oh, okay. And so while we were at boot camp, we both applied for ROTC scholarships. And we found out about 11 months later that we both got accepted. And Stephen decided to go to the University of Florida to be a Gator. And I chose Vanderbilt. At this time, I was naive. I didn't know anything Stephen and I are just like backwoods country <laughs> boys from Georgia, a little bit naive at that time in our lives, didn't know much about colleges. And I'll, the reason why I picked Vanderbilt, I mean, embarrassingly enough, I didn't even know it was a private school before I applied. <laughs> uh, my friend from high school, he went, and between the time that I graduated high school and went to boot camp, he went to Vanderbilt to do his freshman orientation, and I went with him. So it was the only college campus I had ever visited. And so I figured, why not apply there? And I got in. Now, earlier you said Vanderbilt's known as the Harvard of the South. I will tell you this. I did not contribute much <laughs> to uh, that nomenclature. Uh, they are, the people there were brilliant. I think on my freshman hall, there was four people out of maybe 18 or 19 that had perfect on their SATs and I, mine was far from that. So, and I was waitlisted. So I was lucky enough to get in, even luckier to graduate. But I'm fortunate that I did. Are you a so pretty that, good student? Uh, huh. I, I made it through. My what GPA. Was your... Oh, so recently I, I, uh, I didn't even, I've never knew where I ranked in my class at Vanderbilt. And so I applied recently. And we might get to this in the conversation, but I'm currently taking music production classes at a, at a community college here in San Diego. And they needed to see my transcript from Vanderbilt. And I was like, okay. And I'd seen it before, but I didn't really look at it too hard. And I think I graduated like a 2.7. It wasn't great. And maybe like a 2.9. I don't know what it is. It wasn't amazing. And so I looked at the, at the top, they have a ranking. I think I was like four from the bottom of the class <laughs> for my graduating class. But, oh, man. But here we are, retired and at 43. What did you Couldn't study? Too bad. Uh, so my, <laughs> this is where you're gonna, I'm gonna lose points with you, Carl. So I started out computer science and electrical engineering for my freshman year. And then at the end of my freshman year in a 2.096 GPA, I decided I probably should change majors. So I, tra I changed majors to education and social studies. And I'm so glad I did. Well, and I was going to say, I have a computer engineering degree, so kind of like right in line, double E in CS. Um, and I never used, I never used the, the uh, diploma at all, you know, nothing. Yeah. Isn't it funny how that works out? I was biology and chemistry and I never used that either. Yeah. What do you think you ranked, Carl, in your class? I graduated <laughs> magna cum laude. So what's that, like top 5%? Oh. All right. I thought I should have huh? had Suma. I thought, because I got straight A's. Okay, great guys. It was great having this talk with you. <laughs> it, 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 it wasn't a great college. It wasn't at <laughs> Vanderbilt. So at Vanderbilt, I probably would have been uh, down there with David. Yeah. If I had to guess, I mean, a lot of people, I went to Georgia Tech, a lot of people dropped out like freshman year, like a pretty large number um, don't finish. But if I had to guess, probably right in the middle. You know, it's a good spot to be. You know, not that good. You don't get fired from jobs, but you know, no one's like, oh, he's the best at that thing. We want him to do it. So just float right through the middle. No one really notices. Yeah. There's a saying I quite like. I think it goes something like this. Eagles may soar, but weasels don't get sucked into jet engines. Not, not that you're a weasel, Doug, or <laughs> David. You're kind of like, uh, I don't know, what's a good ground animal? Um. A leopard. You guys are leopards. leopards. You, you don't <laughs> soar like an eagle, but... What's a good ground animal? That's, I don't know. Dog. H humans are pretty good. I don't know. I think I'm missing the point. Okay, so you you, um, you went to school, uh, mm -hmm. and then then you... Yeah, t go back yeah. to the timeline here. How did that Sure, work? as soon as you... Gr so that was 1997 to... Or 1998... 
So anyway, I, I graduated December of 01. And as soon as you graduate from an ROTC program, you get your commission. So I was an ensign and then I retired as an 05 at the end of my career. Uh, what, what do those mean? Uh, ensign is an 01. So it's the very first rank of officer and 05 is commander. So it's five ranks up from that. Uh, just before you get to 06, which is captain and who's usually, it's usually an 06, uh, a junior 06 or a senior 05 who are in charge of ships. Okay. Damn, that sounds pretty fancy. I'm going to have to call him Commander David from now on. I take back all those mean things I said about you being a weasel or whatever I said. <laughs> so when did you discover Phi and was early retirement like on your radar? I know, you know, for me, like I said, I had some friends in the military and they would talk about officers that put in their 20 years and then they would, you know, have their pension and then go into consulting and basically have mm -hmm. like, a, you know, a very good sort of retirement and the, yeah, that, that was on their specific plan. So how about mm -hmm. you? Yeah, that's a very common uh, people to spend a, a, a career in the military, particularly the se uh, senior levels, whether it's senior enlisted or senior officers, uh, they usually can get out and get a pretty good government job with decent, very decent benefits for another 20 years uh, or work for the government, other capacities, either education. Uh, so that's very common. So um, I've always been geared towards saving and, and learning about money, or at least thinking that I should be saving. Uh, I remember I was 18 or 19 uh, when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And we can, uh, you know, we can debate the merits of the factuality of the story or not, but I do give it credit for, for the motivation it provided me to learn more and more about money and see money and businesses and how to create income and mindset. Uh, and that's what led me to continue to read, uh, continue to learn and put some things in practice. Uh, but my mid twenties, I was still not, even though I knew the right things to do with money, uh, I never really did, did them. Uh, so in my late twenties, I was, I had some credit card debt, I think like 26,000 in credit card debt. I'd been saving in my thrift savings plan, which is similar to a civilian 401 and I think I had like 40 something thousand in that. So I wasn't like doing terrible, but uh, at, at, with each pay raise, uh, especially on the officer side, you get some significant bumps. Uh, so I, kn I knew I had to start doing something pretty soon. Uh, so I ended up paying off all of the credit card debt and really propelling my savings uh, before I ever even knew what FI was. And this was, you know, late 2000s. So 2008, 9, 10. I was in my last job in Norfolk. And Stephen said, Stephen, my brother, he said, Hey, I'm going to go to this camp mustache in May. I think this was, uh, must've been like November, October, November of the year before. Do you want to go? I'm like, okay, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. And so he sent me a link to some of Mr. Money Mustache's stuff. Uh, and I loved how logical, linear, practical it was. And for somebody who thinks like, I think uh, very little gray, very, uh, you know, cause and effect kind of things. And <clears throat> so I still didn't even between the time that Stephen told me and the time that we actually went to the event, I didn't even do too much digging really. Uh, but I went to the event. I didn't know who people were. I didn't, I've never met Pete before or even knew what he looked like. Um, I met Doug, Doug Nordman there who has been a mentor and a good friend for ever since that day. Uh, and I think uh, Paula Pant from Afford Anything was there. A mad scientist, uh, Brandon was there. So that was a pretty good first event for me to uh, dip my toes into the financial independence community. And then after that, Stephen and I just kind of got the bug and he started his Camp Fi events the following year. And I went on to uh, create some, uh, some education materials uh, for financial independence. Uh, and that was in 2018 when that got published. <clears throat> it's still going. Uh, and I think about 10,000 people have gone through that course so far, uh, but it's, it's been pretty great to see some of the benefit come from that. Many people at Camp Fives will show up and say, hey, uh, actually, I think it was last time you, Carl, you and I were in, in Colorado. Uh, there was a couple there and they, they think that going through the phyology course actually uh, benefited their marriage. So that's great to get that kind of feedback. And maybe you get this kind of feedback from what you do in the space. 
Carl, you have a very successful 1500 days blog and this podcast. And I know Doug has his uh, hands in a few things that provide value to others. So you might not always get that feedback, but it's always great to get the feedback. And it becomes pretty rare for me because I don't go to many of these events and I'm not too much uh, involved in the the tight circles, uh, but um, it's always good. So that's where I learned about financial independence. I didn't think, I never did want to get another job after. So even if I never thought about financial independence, I probably would have never worked anyway. Uh, I would, it might've been a little more clumsy getting there. And maybe I would have stayed in a few more years uh, just because of the stability of it. Uh, but once I did find financial independence uh, and it was defined as very clearly 25 times uh, your needed expenses, then the objective was there. The goalpost was placed. And I said, let's get there pretty quick. And we did that. And what year was that uh, camp mustache that you went to? I think it was 2016. Okay. May of 2016. I'm just curious. Do you get a lot of feedback? We could talk about phylogy a little bit later. Do you get a lot of sure. feedback from that? You said you've had 10,000 people go through the course. And can you... Or at least enroll in the course, yes. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit what it is? And it's completely free too, correct? It is, yes. Very, very free. Very completely free. Um, so it is a... Think of it as an escort through the concepts of financial independence. It starts with what is financial independence and why you might want to pursue financial independence. Then it gets more specific about debt repayment, real estate, and what role that may or may not play uh, in a part of your financial independence. And it, and it goes on for 52 concepts, and it links. In each lesson, there's a an introductory paragraph uh, from my point of view, and then I link to blogs, podcasts, videos that support that uh, concept. Uh, and those are podcasts, blogs, and videos of other people in the space that have create really great content. Uh, and in addition to that, there's a free fillable PDF phylogy workbook that you can download. And that that's where you make it personal. That's where as you're going through the lessons, you can record and have those conversations uh, with your loved ones or whoever you're you're going through it with, uh, or even just record your own individual uh, responses for uh, posterity's sake. Cool. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Ed, did you have, I know you have real estate now. Did you have real estate before discovering financial independence, before this whole camp mustache moment? I did. So I purchased my first rental property in middle Georgia, a town called Warner Robins. It's where our hometown, where we grew up. And I bought that property in 2011. It's in a traditional brick ranch style home, three bedroom, two bath. And I had that for a few years. And I think I bought another one in 2013 and then uh, one every year, every few years after that uh, in the same area. And at the peak, I think I had seven properties. And as I was getting closer to my retirement date, I knew I didn't want to keep having to manage or repair. And many were coming into the point where they were going to need some significant repair for me to continue to rent them out uh, for the rent that I would demand. And so I, instead I just sold some of them off and paid off the liens on the other properties. So now I currently have uh, four paid off properties, uh, no liens in middle Georgia, providing about 3,500 a gross uh, income a month. And what year did you sell the other properties? I sold, I think I sold one in 2021. And then uh, probably the other two, uh, the, the year before that. Okay, great. So you saw um, good appreciation on those properties, right? I did. And uh, so the, the getting was good for anybody who had, it's still good, pretty good. Uh, but for anybody who's held properties that long, or at least over the last decade for any duration of time, you've probably made some good money. And I saw that as an opportunity to go ahead and take, get while the getting was good. And at the same time, as I looked to retirement, I wanted to simplify things. So I really just think like the fewer, fewer pin strokes, the fewer steps to get things done. I uh, just really simplify. So I actually 
got rid of mo all, almost all my credit cards. I did the credit card hacking for a little bit, but I stopped doing all that just because I just didn't want to deal with it. Uh, it wasn't in my, at the time I was valuing simplicity. So reduce all that. Uh, I think I have like two credit cards now and uh, bank accounts closed ones I wasn't using uh, or even, uh, you know, transfer money and close them out. So there's a lot of things I did to simplify uh, my life uh, at that time. And, and that was under the art, getting rid of some of the properties that I knew would be a, or I believe to be, would be a headache going forward. Uh, that was in alignment with that. Cool. All right. Let's, um, let's shift gears to like when you retired or maybe even approaching it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we set this up, like high paced job, uh, somewhat stressful through the years, it sounded like you had a better lifestyle uh, towards mm -hmm. the end. But, you know, what were you doing as you were about to retire? Like you knew that everything was going to change and you would have a ton of free time. So when we'll break this up. So, yeah, leading up to it, did you have any plans or expectations, um, let's say like the, the year or six months leading to your mm -hmm. last day of work? Yes. So I got very lucky that, well, if there's anything lucky about COVID, uh, that <laughs> the policy came out where you could, normally you would have to use or lose leave uh, by October. So you can carry 60 days on the books, but if you haven't had anything above 60 days on the books, uh, you would have to uh, use it before October or anything above that 60 days would get knocked off. Uh, the next month, uh, bringing you back down to 60 and then continuing to rebuild. Well, there was an exception to policy and that uh, allowed me to uh, not take leave. And so whenever I actually retired, my official retirement date was April, like March 31st or April 1st of uh, 2021. So then you back up 20 days of leave for normal uh, separation type stuff and then add on all the leave that you build up. So actually my last work day was November was Thanksgiving of the year before. So because we knew we were going to have all that time, we, we wanted to take a vacation and that's when uh, the family, we sold our house in Virginia and then went for three months in Hawaii. And the long-term plan was that after Hawaii, we would come back, uh, set up residence here in San Diego uh, where my family is from originally. Uh, and, uh, so that's why we're back here. So that was a long-term plan. And then we would focus on happiness once we got here, uh, whatever that after military life looked like. Uh, so that was the long-term plan. Uh, if Maritza, my uh, ex-wife wanted to go back to work, she could, uh, and, or she could go before too, but if she wanted to go back to work, it would, it would be uh, much more uh, feasible for her to do that here in San Diego. Uh, she's a hairstylist. She's amazing at what she does. Uh, so that was the long-term plan that we would, our son, who's going to be, who at the time was eight, seven or eight, we would stay here at least in, through his graduation of high school. Got it. Okay. So that's leading up. And then Carl, any follow-up questions on the, the lead up to retirement? Um, I Did you do anything specific to prepare money-wise or... Uh, was it just going on that big three month uh, trip to Hawaii? And I guess what was the Hawaii trip like? Did you decompress on that? Were you, uh, I'm asking a bunch of stuff here, but at sure. that time, were you stressed out? Like after that Thanksgiving, when you stopped working, did you have to decompress? Where were you at that point? And where were you in your career at that point? So at that point in my career, I, I've been preparing for years, really. Uh, in the military, they make you notify them that you want to retire. At nine to 11 months out. So it's not that you're all of a sudden you're making the decision and then in a few weeks later you're out the door. So you, you do have time to prepare. You've gone through the medical reviews for you know potential disability. You've gone through uh, some other training that helps, uh, that meant to help you uh, reintegrate back into the you know, civilian world. But personally, uh, I think I was fine. I think I was already prepared because one, I've, I've had the mindset for a number of years of the financial independence mindset. Like, why are you doing it? And once you have the why down, of course, everything be, else becomes a little more uh, linear and, and easier to understand and easier to justify. So compared to other people, I think I was much more prepared. Um, and yes, I was ready. The, the Hawaii trip was just meant to be a vacation. 
And I, but ironically enough, I did get very antsy there. And I don't know if it was uh, being, you know, on Oahu. And they say after you're there for a few weeks, and you know, either fall into two categories, the people who want to stay there forever or the people who get really, really antsy and, and ready, ready to get off the island. Uh, between that and uh, just not knowing what, even though I was prepared, I really did have, uh, I don't want to say anxiety, but uh, I was really getting antsy. And I even flew from Hawaii to Phoenix for a job interview before my actual retirement date uh, because, uh, so I guess maybe I wasn't as prepared as I thought, Carl. Um, <laughs> so I was really considering taking another job. Uh, I'm certified to teach in JROTC program at high schools. So I was like, okay, well, we, let's get back. Maybe we can live in Phoenix. It's, it's pretty close to San Diego. Uh, let me just fly there and see what's going on. So I did. I, I ended up not uh, deciding not to take the job. Uh, but it, that did represent that I was getting antsy and maybe a little bit uh, some tension about what to do next, if anything. Uh, and that wasn't the first time. Once I got in San Diego, I also considered taking uh, two other jobs uh, in both NJROTC high school positions, but ultimately decided against it uh, just because for much of what I said before, when it came down to it, I don't want the next 20 years to look like my last 20 years. And while that is somewhat different, uh, and I'm sure it would have been a very rewarding career, a second career, uh, I just wasn't ready for me personally. There's things I wanted to do. Uh, and if I were to take one of those jobs, uh, then I wouldn't have been able to get to do those things or at least focus on them as much as I'd like. What made you take the, the interviews? And, and it wasn't just one, right? So you did three and then you, you arrived at, hey, this isn't a good fit. There's some other stuff I want to do. And the opportunity cost uh, don't, don't work out. So yeah, why, why keep doing the interviews? Because it's still somewhat exciting to think that you can get paid very handsomely to uh, do something that you could find rewarding and also fun. And I think I would be great at doing that. Uh, I think I could provide benefit to the school and the program and the kids. Uh, and, and that feels good, you know, for somebody who's service oriented, has been and wants to be still. Um, there's a value in that. It feels good to do good. And so that's probably why I, I kept uh, deciding to take the interviews and consider it. Uh, and, and again, I may work for money again one day, but just right now, uh, it's just not on the cards. You're in San Diego, David. I think you should go out for the Navy SEALs. Uh, there probably are some age restrictions on that. And even <laughs> if there weren't, I'm sure there's some physical restrictions on me that would not qualify me. Ah, I, I, I believe in you, David. Just make up something about your age. Tell them you're 19. You're pretty spry. Thank you for that. But I think their background <laughs> checks are fairly thorough. <laughs> yeah, you're already Especially for somebody who's already been in the Navy yeah. for 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, one thing you mentioned, David, um, to Carl is like, hey, you know, put on your to-do list to like, don't do stuff on, on your list. Did you have, and it sounds like you're a busybody also. I have spent time with you and I know you are. So did you reach a point where you, you were like, I have to uh, enforce laziness on myself? And if so, how did that look? Well, you can say laziness, but I think that doesn't necessarily have to have a negative connotation. Uh, normally it does, but in this case it's not because it's for an objective, right? So if you know your natural inclination is to be a busybody, uh, then you and you know you don't want to be that way going forward, you actually have to use that type A personality and take intentional action to try to change that habit or that trait somewhat. Uh, and yes, so there are times where I sit back and think, okay, is it okay if I just sit and watch TV for two hours and do nothing? And the answer is yes, it is okay. Uh, one thing I've learned since I've retired is nobody really cares what you do as long as, <laughs> as, long as it's within legal bounds and uh, you know, you're, you've got your immediate sphere of influence like Carl. I know you've got Mindy and the kids uh, and you've got you know, your wife and your dog kid, uh, Doug. And so you've got responsibilities to those people in your life. But beyond that, you can, I think people should just do whatever they find enjoyable and really don't care what other people think. So if that means sitting on the couch for three hours or five hours or all day long, what's the, what's the downside if you enjoy it? 
what did you watch? Oh, good question. I don't really watch that much TV. <laughs> Having said that, <laughs> I don't watch much TV. But uh, football season's always good. So on Saturday and Sunday, I'll have, have football on in the background uh, while I'm doing something. And, and I might even sit down and watch a little bit of it. Uh, but let's see. Some things that I've watched, I'm probably dating how long ago I've actually watched a series. Queen's Gambit was good. That was one of the better things I'd seen on TV in a while. I think that's Netflix. Uh, the Peripheral is something new that's out on Netflix or Amazon Prime. I'm not sure. Okay. But I'm get, that's that's pretty well done so far. So just general things like that. Okay. And I'll, I'm going to turn you on to a genre that maybe you haven't explored, and that's like the Hallmark Christmas movies. Mm -hmm. And they're they're very good. Uh, you'll be able to yes. find them in many of the streaming platforms. I'm trying to get Carl into these, but um, they're they're just wonderful movies. So. They are so. Yes, that's a. Uh, I, I watch them all the time. But most recently, <laughs> there's a new. It's a musical, but they make fun of musicals in the musical with Ryan Reynolds and Will Ferrell, and it's just popped up. And my son and I watched that the other day, and it's a little long, but it, there's some. Definitely good. Uh, good. It's worth watching once. Okay, I'll check that out. I saw the previews for it. So, and Carl, have you actually watched one of the Hallmark movies yet? I have watched zero of them, and like to keep it that way for as long as possible. But maybe for you, Doug, you can yeah. recommend one, and I'll break down. It's a short commitment, right? They're not like three and a half hours long. No, they're usually very tight, like an hour and a half, and they kind of follow a prescripted uh, storyline. So, I mean, they're pretty good. They're dumb. I mean, they're often dumb, but they're. Uh, they're fun this time of year, you know? Do you have to have the Hallmark Channel or some special? How do you watch these films? They are, uh, they're often on streaming platforms. So you could like just look up like a uh, Hallmark Christmas movie and then many of them will pop up. Some are bad. We actually stopped. If you could imagine that, some of them are bad. Well, but uh, we, we watched like 10 minutes and we're like, ah, this one sucks. But the, the one we watched after that was really good. It was excellent. This is your calling, Doug. I think you should have a site where you rank them, like the 10 best Hallmark movies or Hallmark movies ranked from best to worst. You always see those oh, yeah, things yeah. pop up. Yeah. Another, or we could do a podcast, like maybe David, you and I can do one and I'll watch them and then you could just make fun of me when I talk about them. <laughs> can we, do we have to wait to make fun of you? Can we do that? <laughs> no, no, you can no? start right away. That'll be part of the, the show. <laughs> Hey Doug, so what's your like? You you have a lot of uh, things going on, uh, many jobs, I believe. So when are you gonna call it financially independent and and call it good? I know I've had this conversation with you in person, but you right. always come up with some reason not to do it. Not to do it. Yeah, you know, I think technically, you know, we hit the five point, but the work that I'm doing is like this, you know, just hanging out, talking to people. So th there's some, you know work related to it that isn't as fun the admin stuff but it's fine so i i don't think i'll i'll hang it up and say i'm retired i know that's um people have an issue if you're doing any kind of work so i've never said that i'm retired and i probably won't and i'll keep doing something i may do you know i'm not sure when but i may do like a very long sabbatical where it's like a year or two where Maybe it's kind of what you described, David, where I'm like, all right, I'm not going to do anything because like all three of us, like I have a, the tendency, I'll see an opportunity like the house that you just got, Carl, like I see an opportunity and I'm like, oh, that looks kind of fun. And it ends up being like a big chunk of work. So I'll have to not start anything new and like close the door on things that I had been working on to actually take a sabbatical and like not do shit for a little while and then not start anything new. Cause I'm like, Oh, then I could like journal the process and then talk about it later, which is just doing more work again. True. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so I'm not yeah. sure. So, so Carl, you mentioned you're going to do, uh, you'd like to do Spanish. See, oh, what else is on your list that once you get this renovation done, uh, I've been working on an art project. It's a web comic and that'll be called annoying humans with a Z on the end. Uh, yeah, I've got, uh, I think I'm missing something here. There's a couple other things that I don't remember, but. Piano. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Piano is one of them. And just working out, David, I'd like to uh, – so I plan to be done with this remodel probably in the next four weeks or so. And I really want to – Mindy and I have been going back to the gym, but I really want to go back starting in January. And that's why I want to come visit you. I think you and Doug did like 18 pull-ups or some crazy thing like that. And I could do like 10 now. But I'd like to be able to do the same amount as you, David. So – my motivation, January, I'll hit the gym hard, maybe like two or three hours a day and just focus on health. Yeah. Nice. It ha- How yes. many pull-ups can you do, uh, David? You just sent me a video the other day. I did? You got to yeah, roll with it. You I, told me about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. Uh, well, you do have a video of me doing pull-ups for sure. I did. Yeah. Uh, when you came to visit, we were out in Imperial Beach and we both did a quick pull-up competition right there on the beach. Imagine a uh, Venice Beach type uh, with, you know, maybe not as muscular dudes hanging out. Uh, I think we were very, very close to, to matching each other's performance. So lately, I, I think I just did a, a max set, not perfect form, but decent form. 20 is what I got to. My peak was 25, and I think it was at last February. So coming up on a year ago, uh, I did 25. And that's when I was actually focusing on trying to do more pull-ups. And there's there are some apps out there that if you just go to whatever Google Play Store or the App Store and put in pull-ups, you know, you'll somebody can find uh, just just an app that'll tr- tell you to do you know five five sets, you know five depending on you'll do a max, you put in your max number, and then it'll give you pre-programmed number of reps and sets to do each time, and you usually do that like every other day, uh, forty eight hours in between each, and so that got me from. I think 16 to 25 pretty quick you know within about a month so if anybody's wanting to learn how to do more pull-ups which is a very hard exercise to do especially for tall uh, lanky people like me uh, that's that's one way to do it i'm reading a book now by a navy seal and don't spoil it for me because i don't know if he's successful or not but i'm at the point in the book where he's trying to set a world record for the most number of pull-ups in 24 hours and i think the record he's trying to beat is like 4,080 or something like that. Can you imagine doing 4,000 pull-ups in 24 hours? I think he said, oh, I only have to do like six every minute to beat the record. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> that's craziness. So, yeah. yeah. That's a great book, by the way. Yeah. you. So David yeah. Noggins, you've read David Goggins, Goggins Can't Goggins, Hurt Goggins, Me. Goggins, sorry. Yeah. The name of the book is Can't Hurt Me. And I've purchased that book for other people and I've listened to the audio book. Uh, and if you're, if you, this is your first time hearing about the book. I recommend the audio book because he goes through, there's a narrator that reads the book and then he's next to the narrator and adds his two cents after each chapter or during the reading. That makes it pretty valuable uh, compared to the book, which is also valuable. Yeah, it's great. That guy's a freaking animal. He's awesome. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's see what we are talking about, uh, working out and stuff, which we'll, we'll jump back to. Cause I think, I mean, mm-hmm. you spent a lot of time on that, but one thing Carl and I need to do is talk about how to support the show. So we're trying to integrate this stuff. So David, I can't remember if we told you, but we are trying to avoid ads. We may still test them, but we're trying to avoid ads. So we're accepting donations. So do you want mm-hmm. to commit <laughs> to support the show? Well, I'll ask you later. Don't answer. I don't want you to influence other people. But have you ever uh, donated to like a podcast or even like public radio or something like that where it's like listener supported kind of stuff? He did. I'll speak for David for a second while he thinks about this. I know David uh, supported Economy, right? You, you gave, oh, yes. You helped yeah, get economy. the Economy Conference off the ground, which is great. I'm so thankful you did that. I don't think you were even there. Where are you? Stephen was there. I get. No, I did not go to that one. Uh, but yes, um, Diana Merriam runs a great economy conference. Uh, she's been great for the space. And uh, I've heard nothing but great things about the economy conference from anyone who's attended. So I expect that she'll be doing it again next year. And so if any of your list- listeners are uh, in uh, the area, and I believe it's Cincinnati or St. Louis? Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Uh, then definitely uh, look into the economy EC. O N O M E economy. Uh, and Diana Moran puts on a really good event there. And again, nothing, nothing but great things. Heard. Yeah. It is March uh, 17th through the 19th. I was just looking at it this morning. Doug and I will be there. 
Yep. But anyway, you were talking about our, <laughs> yeah. so we got off topic. Some, somehow Diana inserted her ad into our ad, which is oh. like a ninja move. But anyway, so we're over on buymeacoffee.com, which is similar to Patreon. It just gives us a little bit more capability and people can make a one-time donation. But what we really love is like members to support each month and it starts at five dollars and you get extra content so i know um, we actually got some backlash on youtube youtube's a crazy place but people were like ah you know we have these retired people asking for donations and the thing is it costs money and time to produce the shows and we're trying we're trying not to lose money like every week <laughs> is, is the deal and we've we've supported the show ourselves for like a year and a half we have alan donegan's show rebel entrepreneur that we're also producing so we're just trying to uh, not lose money and if you if you can donate it's great it pays for uh the hosting it pays for virtual assistants to help us produce the show in a couple doug of i'm sold I'll, I'll contribute awesome so just takes a, a little bit to help us out each month and help bring you the show and hopefully not have ads for uh, one company that just went under uh, recently is BlockFi, right? So BlockFi like advertised all over the place. They have supported FinCon, other shit. So we don't want to have ads um, from companies like BlockFi, which I think we can say because they just filed for bankruptcy, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we'll put a link and it's over at myhifi.com slash donate. And we appreciate anyone that uh, has a chance to donate. And we uh, put extra content up there. So some of the stuff is like extra pictures. Uh, we're going to start posting more things. And then we'll have a little hangout with Carl and I and Alan Don again. I think quarterly is what we'll do. And you'll be able to hop on the Zoom call with us and just like participate and hang out and chat with us. Cool. And maybe David will join us for a Zoom call too. We'll have a special guest. Yeah, we can do that kind of thing. Okay, so David, do you want to say anything? It looks like you're about to say something funny. Well, no, but did you want to talk more about uh, physical stuff? Because that was a big yeah. issue. I don't know if we're getting close to the time limit here. Yeah, yeah, we can shift over to physical stuff. Sure. David. So whenever I, yeah, go ahead, Carl. Oh, no, I know you have a crazy diet. You're an inspiration because when I saw you in May, I saw how fit you are. And then you sent me some pictures. You're like, here's my meal for the next like three months. And it was just like a million different containers of chicken, broccoli. I don't know if there was rice in there, but eating the exact same thing, which I think is pretty valuable. Um, having a consistent, healthy diet. And I think you called it meal planning. Yes. So whenever I finally got settled here in San Diego, which was about July of 2021. There's really no more excuses to you know, eat out or eat out often. And so I just got into meal planning. And so for the first, I don't even think for the entire July, I even worked out hardly at all, but my weight dropped so much that I was at 18% body fat at the beginning of July. And at the end of July, I think I was must have been down to like 12 or 13. And I think that was just based on meal prep. Uh, so, and then after that, uh, the next step would be uh, I went plant based for about six months, hired a trainer, uh, got down to sub 10 uh, while gaining a little bit of muscle. So, uh, sub 10% body fat. And then every month after that, I would just add a look, another little challenge, uh, whether it be, working out more often or changing my workout up and just trying to see what the results of that. And I would, I would advise you know, people to do that. Don't necessarily, you know, YouTube or Google the best workout for this, come up with something that you think is going to work out for your own particular situation. You know how you feel, you know how your body reacts, uh, at least at this age, uh, people should know how their body reacts to certain things uh, and then just do it. And then take that data at the end of a month and adjust as necessary or as you desire. Uh, but I will say uh, one thing that really did benefit me was doing the monthly in-body scans uh, because it's one thing to say, oh, I still look okay with my shirt off. Uh, but the other part is actually seeing data to establish a trend line in one direction or the other. And then you can use that trend line to to further adjust whether it's meal planning or or more exercise or less exercise. Uh, one, one very curious thing I did discover, though, uh, I was trying to get down to 7% body fat by this by the end of this last June. And uh, it was kind of turned into like a sort of a disaster because at the end of May, I was still doing well. And then I had this plan to just do 20,000 steps a day. And then starting June 1st, 
So 21,000 June 1st, 22,000 June 2nd, and do that all the way to the end of June and basically force my body to have no other option uh, than to lose a little bit of weight. But what ended up happening, uh, I actually cut my calories. I think I was doing like 1,300 calories a day during then, maybe a little bit more. And six days in, I went and got my next end body scans just to see how the trend was going. And it, it turns out I actually burnt a lot of muscle and gained body fat, which you would not think is possible. So I would say um, always consider like where you're at. I think if you're above, if you're male and you're above 10% body fat, uh, then that's okay probably to, and, and if losing weight is your goal, do that. But once you get below 10% body fat, I would almost say cut out the cardio uh, other than just for, you know, the 10 minutes to warm up and maintain good cardio health. But Cut, cut out as much as you can and just focus on weights if you're wanting to preserve uh, muscle mass uh, because as long as you're, your eating doesn't return too sloppy, I don't think you're going to gain that weight back. And where are you at uh, right now? Right now, uh, it's been about a month and a half since I did an in-body scan, uh, but right now I'm probably 181, 180, and at uh, probably 9.7% body fat, I would guess. And where do you where do you want to be at like a sustainable level? Because seven percent, like if you made it there, I yeah, assume you don't want to live that way, right? No, I would not want to live that way. Uh, once you get you have many issues once you get down to that low percent body fat, uh, and it's even the issues are more significant for females. And, and uh, but as far as like hormone production, mood, all of those things, it's just not something that it's not. I don't believe it. I'm sure it's sustainable. I just don't know that it would be in either that healthy to sustain it long-term or definitely wouldn't be that enjoyable to sustain that long-term. Uh, so my, my next goal is to put, just put on some more muscle mass, uh, maybe uh, five or six pounds over the next few months. And, but I've been slacking a little bit. So my five days a, a week w working out, have gone down to like three. So, but we'll get there. I feel you. Yeah, I am. Um, I am struggling with motivation. I still go to the gym, but my workouts are shit like in the last month or so. And I think part of it is like the season and part of it is just like eating over the holidays. And I went back to Georgia where I'm from also and visited family and just ate like trash the whole time. It was fun, it re really fun, drank a ton and it was a blast. Um, so, so what do you do when your motivation is lacking? How do, do you... Sure. Um, just try to force yourself. Are your workouts worse now too? Cause mine, I'm just like, I just don't feel like it. Right. So then I think you have to just bring the scope back a little bit. So I think Carl, you were talking about two or three hour workouts. Well, if you, if you're looking forward to a, if you're having already having motivational issues and then you looking forward to an air quotes, looking forward to a two, three hour workout at the gym, uh, then you're probably not likely to go do it or at least less likely to go do it. But if you take that objective and focus on what habit you're trying to create, which is actually go to the gym or actually go work out if you've got a garage gym, then just don't focus on what you're going to do when you get there. Just focus on getting there. So then the objective becomes walking in the doors of the gym or going downstairs to the, to the basement and grabbing dumbbells. And let that be the objective. And it, mentally, it takes away a lot of the, uh, like that, that upward movement, that, that pre-stress, uh, just, just walk in the gym and let that be the goal. And if you can do that five days in a row, you probably will have gotten some decent workouts, gotten back in more of a, a positive mindset and, and created a habit that will probably carry you forward for at least the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. so, so David, we had a recent guest who, you know, Rachel Richards, who said what she does is she sets a goal and then she says, if she doesn't make it, I'm going to give someone like X amount of money. So that's really motivation for her. So I think, Doug, you should do that. And I think your goal, I'm going to set this for you. You can tweak it a little bit, but maybe 200 pull-ups at once. And if you don't, if you can't accomplish that in the next three months, you have to give me like uh, $10,000. <laughs> I believe in you, Doug. I don't yeah. want that money from you. I, I think you can do this. I think... Um... That, that sounds great. I think my, my elbows will fall off. I'll, my tendons will 
not enjoy that very much. It'll be worth it. You need to read that David Goggins book again. He had like shin splints and micro fractures and he still ran on that seal beach and all that. And David's yeah. going to be a Navy SEAL soon. So there's right. inspiration all around you. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I listen, I listened to the book too. Again, highly recommended. And I was like, I don't know how he, like if you, you know, rupture your Achilles, like you're done, like you're out. And I'm not as tough as him, clearly, right? I'm like, I can't work out hard enough. I don't have motivation. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we'll we'll have to tweak that a little bit. Okay. Know? Maybe 20 pull-ups. Yeah. I don't, Doug, aim high. It's just a little bit more sore, of a stretch. Sore like a leopard. <laughs> okay, so before we uh, wrap it up here, um, anything else fitness or health related um, before I ask a couple final questions here? I would just say that if, if people have, I know Rachel Richards, she's, uh, I saw it before I got off social media. I did see that she had some posts on there where she was really focusing on hers, uh, on her fitness and, and achieving a lot of her goals. Uh, I will say, uh, one week or even one month does not a trend to make. Uh, so give yourself some grace, uh, but you know, do the work. And if, if 30 days goes by and you haven't seen the progress that you thought you might see. Just do a minor tweak. It usually doesn't take much to to get that trend line going back in the right direction. But give yourself some grace. It's just time. David, I will see you at the pull-up bars in Imperial Beach probably around April or May. I look forward to it. I now I've got to like uh, now I've got to get up my my pull-ups up to like forty so that you don't come beat me. Oh God! <laughs> Note to self: send David some ho hos. Is there like a hostess like box I can send you every week? What, what's your favorite mm. junk food, David? Oh, I'll hook you up. It's probably ginger beer and proper twelve Irish whiskey. That's probably my favorite junk food. <laughs> <laughs> got it. It's a drink. That's awesome. Okay, so you actually teed us up perfectly. You quit social media. Uh, when was that? Why are you doing it? How's it turning out so far? So it, it wasn't an easy call. Uh, I'm a huge believer of like garbage in, garbage out. And I, for there's as soon as I say that, I know there's going to be a lot of people that say, "But there's some good that comes from social media." I know, but but then you then you can have it. Uh, but for me, uh, it was. I think the net positive necessarily wasn't there, and. Sure, I could just not log on, but then you always have that thing in the back of your head that says, should I log on? What's, what's going on there? So I didn't want that to keep nagging at me, uh, especially if you have a brand like Phyology or Mile High Fi or 1500 Days or Bigger Pockets Money. Uh, if you have a brand, you almost need to have an online presence. Uh, so thinking about that with Phyology is I, w I look back and the Phyology growth really wasn't coming from social media. Uh, so I was like, okay, well, uh, the data point isn't there for me to continue to justify that from a branding standpoint. Part of that's my fault too. I just didn't want to put that much energy into it. Uh, I'm sure I know there's, there's plenty of people who are successful at doing social media marketing, uh, but I just, everything I had tried in the past, I didn't get the results and I didn't want to keep putting more energy into it. So I just got off of it and I don't miss it for one second, really. I mean, I, I never even think about it. How long ago was that? It's probably a couple months ago. And it's, it's along the lines of like watching news media. I think, you know, garbage in, garbage out. I don't watch any news. Uh, I scroll through the headlines and if something I know about the block fi. I saw that this morning on uh, CNBC. But other than scrolling through the headlines and, and if something catches my eye, I'll read it. Uh, but other than that, I don't really spend too much time on things I can't influence. It's great. Yeah. Any thoughts on social media, Carl? Yeah, I just got a new phone. And every time I've gotten a new phone before, I think it's a time to reset yourself. And I put no social media apps on there. No Twitter, no Facebook. Uh, so yeah, it's great. I don't spend... Lots of time scrolling through crap. Um, I, I used it mainly for information about some of my investments, but I found, hey, I could just listen to this focused podcast for 10 minutes instead of spending 45 minutes a day on Twitter. So, yeah. Gotcha. I will say, though, uh, when I was on Twitter and uh, mostly Twitter, I, I see Mindy and Carl post a lot of things. And uh, I don't know if it's just because I spend more time looking at them. Those are the ones that pop up first for me. But Carla Mindy says some pretty funny things, so I do enjoy their posts uh, when I 
when I stumble on there. I haven't completely deleted tweet, Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest for the phyology stuff yet. I just haven't gotten around to it. So, uh, but I need to do that pretty soon. Do you see it as like a trend that more and more people will do that? Cause I, in you know, a completely different, uh, sort of subculture. I saw someone, uh, they were like, ah, I'm deleting all this shit. It's kind of negative for me and I'm out. And they're, they're a musician, right? So like it's taking them away from their art and what they're trying to work on. So yeah, do you see it as a trend, David, that people are like just clocking out? Well, I've got a 19 year old daughter and she's not on Facebook and I don't think any of her friends are. So if that tells you like, it's probably going to die out. I mean, it's probably just, it's not an if, but a win. And then who knows with everything going on with Twitter right now, how quality that platform is going to be for whatever people uh, find value in. Uh, how, how long that's going to be. So I don't know. I think social media in general, uh, you know, you got MySpace that died out pretty quick. Uh, it's, it's, it might be a, it might be a long-term trend, uh, but I think something else will come along or nothing else will come along and, and it'll probably fall to the wayside where people realize or policies are put in place uh, like mental health policies, maybe uh, going forward. I'd like to see some of that more uh, that control social media, especially with the kids. Yeah, podcast I listened to yesterday, I th it was Derek Thompson. I can't remember what his is called, but it was called, like, Why Are We So Lonely? And I guess teen depression is at an all-time high, and it's obvious why. It's because they are on social media, not so much Facebook anymore, but they've moved on to Snapchat and Instagram and all this other shit. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the points they made was kids still spend a lot of time with each other, but they do it virtually. And there's a lot lost if you're engaging humans, not face to face. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had a maybe similar observation where I'm, I'm trying to uh, limit the time. I like Instagram, a lot of puppies on there and stuff. I dig that. Uh, my friends will have pictures of food. So I'll take a look at that, but I, I'm limiting it to like 15 minutes a day, something like that. Um, but I was going to say recently, like we've done a few things over the holidays and like, we're just hanging out in person. There have been birthday parties and at HQ, I'm like, this is great. Like you get to hang out with people and same when I met you, David, just hanging out and, you know, we're not pulling out our phones or distracted. We're just having conversations, whatever, walking down the beach, we went on a nice hike and then a wonderful dinner you cooked for me. It was, it was kind of romantic actually, David's a uh, smooth, I would say, but but, but yeah, hanging out in person is the whole point. Like the connections that you can make is completely different than, you know, yeah, we're, we're liking each other's posts or something like that, which is pretty empty, I would say. That sounds kind of foul too. You're liking each other's posts. Uh, <laughs> did that happen after or before dinner? Both. I, uh, am I remembering that right, Dave? Both. I think so. Dave's Maybe like, breakfast too. Breakfast the morning after, maybe. I'm not sure. I, I can't remember. But it, I think idea. it also goes back to each of us. We have to ask, like, why do we care about certain things? You know, why do we care? Why do we, you know, you see something and you, if something pisses you off. You're like, why do I care about that? Somebody cuts you off. Why do I care? I mean, yeah. So social media is the same way. Like somebody makes a post. Why do I care? Like, so that, then that becomes more about us. And then we allow that to take from us, really. We give that power away uh, to somebody to have negative influence over us or something to have a negative influence over us. So if you can just methodically reduce the contact points of those kind of interactions, then you have a less chance of a negative response to certain things. But I think it's a self-reflection of, and it's not just social media, it could be personal interactions or it could be your neighbor, it could be anything. Like, why do you, why do you let that get to you? Uh, or, or, or why do you care? And if you get an answer to why you care, then it might help you create that if then statement uh, to better uh, better process those type, type of things. So one quick follow up David and then we'll wrap it up. You had said mm -hmm. earlier today at the Capfi you there was a couple there who said phylogy might have saved their marriage or at least it really helped them out. And I'm sure that made you feel good. And I've thought about that with some of my talks people will come up to me and it feels pretty good when someone tells you that you you gave a good talk, but I think that's kind of caustic too because you're seeking validation from an external source you it's not quite as bad as being negatively affected by a negative interaction but you're still you're still being validated or being affected by something outside of your control i guess what do you think about that 
Well, let's say the intent here matters, right? So, and if, if you know the players uh, personally, or at least over a weekend, I think it's a little bit different than uh, a post on social media. And so if my intent with biology is positive and good, rather than a condemning or berating or condescending, I think that's a different, that's a different uh, way to do it. And we all want to be validated for our efforts, especially when we think our efforts are attempting to help others. Uh, and I think maybe I'm selfish that way, uh, but I'm human. And so it always does feel good when you think that you're putting some good out in the world. Now, if somebody came to me and said, biology ruined my marriage, I hate you, <laughs> uh, and you're to blame, then I think uh, maybe I would have to do some more self-reflection on uh, myself and the product that I'm putting out in the world. Maybe they used it wrong, you know. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Awesome. Anything else, Carl? I think that's all. All right. David, this has been fantastic. Really fun to catch up with you. Where should people find you? Well, Carl, you have my number and Doug, you have my number. So if you could filter anybody that wants to get in contact with me, that'd be great. No, uh, you can either go to Phyology and hit contact. You could do there and then, then I'll uh, send you an email back. Um, I've checked that every couple of days at least. So yes, feel free. And if you're in San Diego or plan to come to San Diego, uh, I would love to uh, take you out for a drink or even a beach walk like Doug and I. It's wonderful. Awesome. Thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast and I'm Doug Cunnington, the Balder host. And Carl Jensen is the cool, sexy one. If you dig the show, please do three things for us. Number one, tell a friend, a family member, an enemy about the show, we really don't care who you tell. Maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word. It's like giving us a virtual high five and uh, actually we don't give high fives in, in person, so the virtual kind's pretty good. And more importantly, your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them. Number two, make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, whatever you're using, and that way you won't miss a show. And number three, please leave us a rating and review. We read them on the show occasionally, and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode. Quick disclaimer, this show is not financial or legal advice. I'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it. It's really just for entertainment, and that's at least what we're hoping for. But seriously, get advice from professionals. Carl and I are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk. So we'll catch y'all next week. Okay, David, we've been asking a lot of people what their favorite Taylor Swift song is recently. So do you, do you have a favorite? Are you excited about the new album that just came out? What's your deal? Who is Taylor Swift? Oh, man. We're not going to be able to answer this. Is, is, that a, is she a rapper? <laughs> I thought you are into music. I honestly have not listened. I know she just released a new album, and it's off the charts. I think it broke some records for having so many number ones at one time, or so many top ten hits at one time, like all of them at once, right? Yeah. So I have not listened to a single song off of that album, but I know a lot of other people are listening to it, and I'll get to it eventually. Do you know what Taylor Swift's net worth is, David? Uh, venture, I guess. I looked this up a couple days ago, actually. Fifty-eight million. Uh, more, much more, actually. Five hundred and eighty million. You're pretty close. I think the number was four hundred and fifty million, and I don't know if that includes her ticket sales or proceeds from the album and. Uh, tour that she's doing but man that's a lot of money uh, my next question was is she single is she i'm not sure did you hear about the tour though like she broke the website or the, the ticketing website couldn't keep up for the demand and they all like sold out in like a minute and then way under like every single ticket for every show for that she's going to be doing next year just sold out like immediately and there was like twice as many people in line than were actually able to get tickets or maybe more yeah it's crazy. So she's gonna she's gonna be raking it in next year. She might go over that one billion mark maybe by the end of next year. 
So, so David, she last time up. we checked, you were still in the dating game, and I'm just saying she's single and she's got some money. She might have you sign a prenup, but I don't, I don't know. It'd be- <laughs> it would be very smart for her to do so. Yes, <laughs> very wise. Well, Carl and I just started getting into Taylor's music, and um, it's fine. Every, everything's fine. Some catchy songs, good pop songs. Carl, I was surprised you checked it out, but I think you it was under uh, is duress too strong of a word. Um, yeah, kind of dress, maybe. I did listen to her new album. It was on a road trip with my older daughter who bought a ticket to go see her concert. And she bought one ticket. I'm like, what were you doing? How are we going to work that out now? I told you to buy two, so at least I could go too. So I don't know how that's going to work out. But her album is pretty moody. It's kind of like uh, sparse and maybe depressing. I don't know. And lots of F-bombs. I didn't expect that, David. I thought she was clean and wholesome, but apparently not. Well, she might be getting to that point in her life where she just doesn't give a anymore, yeah. and she wants to share that sentiment with everyone. Yeah. All right. Well, you should check it out, David. You don't have to be embarrassed anymore. Everybody's. Can we just it. stop this right now so I can go listen to the Taylor Swift <laughs> album and come back? Let's do you it. Got me so excited about it. 